Hi, Bill Mobley for UCSD TV and the show we call On Our Mind. And I'm very pleased today to be with Dr. Jody Corey Bloom, who's a professor in the Department of Neurosciences and who's very special interest in degenerative disease and whose important work, both research and clinical over the last very many years, have really put UCSD on the map and more importantly, have provided important services to families of folks that are affected by degenerative disease. Jody, welcome. Thank you. Glad you're with me. Yeah, terrific. Tell us about you and tell us about what you do. So I am a neurologist in the Department of Neurosciences and I run the Huntington's Disease Center of Excellence. Uh, there are only 30 of these centers across the country and we're very uh, pleased, very honored to be able to say that we were the first uh, center of excellence west of the Mississippi. Um, we've been a center of excellence for over 10 years now uh, and I think it gives us the opportunity to provide uh, care to patients uh, and their families with Huntington's disease and also do the kind of clinical research that we're really interested uh, in doing. At our center, uh, we actually see patients through what, um, a multidisciplinary clinic and I think this has worked out really well for the patients and their families. So we're able to have a social worker, we're able to have a physical therapist, a nutritionist, uh, a neuropsychologist in the clinic. Uh, and this is really makes it really one-stop shopping, if you will, for the patients and their families. Uh, just yesterday, actually, we had clinic, and you know we were able to uh, get a patient uh, applied for Medi-Cal, that kind of thing, uh, and also find a place for someone else to live. So it's those sort of very nuts and bolts kinds of things that we can do as a result of having that social worker in the clinic. And in the center clinic, the, this multidisciplinary clinic is is important for lots of people but it may be especially important for the folks you care for. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, the Huntington's patients are really so vulnerable and, I th and they have very uh, significant difficulties with mobility. So for them to try and get to four or five different appointments is really difficult. Uh, but to be able to come to the clinic and be seen by all of these clinicians is really, really special, really wonderful for them. And, and you know, I think they also realize that they're getting opportunities, opportunities to, to participate in clinical research, for example, uh, which they wouldn't get anywhere else. How so, terrific. Yeah. It's true. Tell us a bit about Huntington disease. Tell us what people think about the cause of it and maybe give us a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the future with therapies. Yeah, so Huntington's disease is, is, is a neurodegenerative disease and it is basically autosomal dominant uh, neurodegenerative disease. So uh, generally we say that uh, each child has a 50% chance of developing the disease if they have a, a parent who's positive for the abnormal gene. Um, the disease itself is uh, caused by an abnormality on chromosome 4. Uh, and uh, as a result, there's a portion of the DNA and then subsequently the RNA that's, that's too long, if you will. So we call this uh, a, a trinucleotide repeat. Uh, and, and this trinucleotide repeat disorder, there are just too many of these repeats. The protein's too long uh, and as a result probably folds incorrectly, is cleaved incorrectly, and causes clumps in the cell. And we think that it's those clumps that probably cause problems with the cells uh, and actually cause the cell death. Uh, the disease itself usually takes about 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. Uh, and the fascinating thing is that people are born with the mutation. Mm. If we were to test babies, we would know that they have the mutation. And then it takes decades, uh, 20, 30, sometimes 40 years before the disease presents with symptoms. Uh, and so one of the things that we're very um, busy working on here are biomarkers of what we call phenoconversion. So we want to be able to tell when someone's going to convert from just being gene positive to actually having the disease and showing signs of the disease. Uh, and so we have developed uh, several uh, different uh, paradigms uh, in order to be able to try to predict uh, when someone is going to uh, uh, really start showing signs. Some cognitive um, uh, tests that we've been doing. Uh, we have developed something called the UCSD BQ uh, or Behavioral Questionnaire, uh, which is actually able to distinguish uh, patients who are ready to phenoconvert, as we say. Um, and we're also looking in things like saliva to be able to see if we can find the protein, the Huntington protein there, and be able to tell who might be at risk, if we can quantify it, who might actually be at risk for phenoconverting. If, if the gene is active from essentially birth, hmm. 
and you know that gene predicts mm -hmm. the disease, then this approach using biomarkers in saliva makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. because presumably you could intervene from very early in life to prevent the disease. Where, where does that work going? Yeah, exactly. Well, I think the main emphasis right now is on what they call gene silencing. Mm -hmm. and, and many companies are actually involved in gene, different gene silencing techniques. So basically, the, the thought behind this is if you can actually silence this abnormal gene, uh, then you would produce less of this Huntington, have less of this protein in the cells to sort of choke them off. The problem is uh, Huntington is actually a normal protein too. And so the problem is that you would actually be ridding uh, the, the body of, of, of normal Huntington too. So they have to really come up with some ways to selectively get rid of the mutant Huntington, the, the elongated Huntington protein, uh, and keep that from sort of choking off the cells. So there is a clinical trial underway right now in Canada and in Europe looking at something called an ASO, an antisense oligonucleotide. Uh, and the hope is that this will be able to reduce the amount of Huntington that's produced. And so it'll reduce the level of this abnormal protein mm -hmm. in neurons. Right. And the hope then is that you, by doing so, you avoid the disease. I mean, the cure would be turn off that gene selectively right. and, and essentially stop the disease in its tracks. Right. Um, as uh, people like to point out to me, we could probably do away, we could probably rid uh, all cases of Huntington's disease if people wouldn't have children. And, and it's sort <laughs> of, see. you know, it's sort of an interesting thing because we're working so hard to find a mm -hmm. cure to this disease, and yet there really is a, I mean, a kind of a, a common sense thing that we could actually do too. I mean, the, the difficulty is that people don't always know they have Huntington's in their family. That's pretty common. We saw three new patients in clinic yesterday, mm -hmm. two of whom had no idea that there had been Huntington's in their family. So by the time they figured it out, uh, they actually already had three and four children you yeah. know, already. So it's not quite so easy, but, but it is. Social something. engineering is a less attractive proposal to me <laughs> right. than genetic engineering. <laughs> right. And, and the genetic engineering piece has to proceed on along a lot of different tracks, but this gene silencing sounds like a really good option, one, if one could right. pull out the, the abnormal gene. Are there other things going on that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, there are also attempts to perhaps use adenovirus uh, mm -hmm. in order to, as a vector, basically, to sort of deliver uh, a repair mechanism mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to the abnormal cells. Mm -hmm. You know, I think all of these things, though, it, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's not as easy as you might think to, first of all, recruit mm -hmm. um, individuals to the studies. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three uh, clinical trials ongoing right now, and I feel very good about them. We've actually been able to recruit uh, people reasonably, but these are early stage studies, yeah. um, and we really want to start uh, with uh, unimpaired people if we can. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's a little bit difficult. There you're taking somebody who's working, you know, who maybe is doing okay, but has the gene. Mm -hmm. They know, uh, looking at their parents, for example, that they might be ready to phenoconvert in a few years. Mm -hmm. They would be the ideal person to actually start delivering some of the therapies to, and they're a little hesitant, you, you, and you, yeah. can, you can see why. Yeah. yeah. You know, you and I think we're at a meeting where we heard a story about someone who, um, whose family had Huntington disease, mm -hmm. and there was, a, there was an expectation. She just assumed that she mm -hmm. was going to have this disorder, mm -hmm. and um, she arranged to have genetic testing done to prove it. <laughs> and there was a party. She decided she was going to have a party one way or the other, and she invited her friends to come over, and she picked up the phone. And the answer was, you don't have the gene. Mm. And you would have thought, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. But her experience of that was, so who do I relate to now? I've made all these connections mm -hmm. with the Huntington disease community. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't belong anymore. Now, she's gotten over that over time. Mm -hmm. But there was a very social piece to this mm -hmm. as well. It wasn't just the medicine. and. And, and, and supporting yeah. family members, but there was also yeah. a social context that this was very upsetting to her. Yeah, you're so right, Bill. I mean, it's huge. We we have a support group um, at UCSD, and and every month uh, we kind of meet as a group. It's it is a large family. There are a hundred people or more, you know, who attend that, and patients and family members. Um, they really identify with it. We have a 
a walk, a Huntington's walk on yeah. April 10th. Mm -hmm. So it is, it becomes a way of life. It becomes, uh, there, and there are a lot of interesting uh, facets to it when you really think about it. So there is survival's guilt, for example. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, siblings for ex where, where one sibling tests positive, one sibling tests negative, and the one who tests negative you would think would be joyous, but they're very sad, very sad, and, and they have a lot of survivor's guilt because they didn't get the gene and their sister did or their mm -hmm. brother did, that mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And as you said, they've identified with the community for a long time. So part of that comes about because uh, we don't test people right away or they choose not to be tested right away. So the, uh, the numbers are something like less than 10% of people with Huntington's disease get tested. Wow. But I will tell you, um, when I started doing this, I, I took over this clinic in 1996. When I started doing it, I thought, there's a test. Why aren't these people getting tested? And now, after all these years, I've come around to a different place. And I think that I probably wouldn't get tested myself. Um, and mainly it's because I know myself and I know that I need to sort of be able to get up every morning and have the whole world ahead of me. I think I couldn't deal with it emotionally. It would be a really black cloud or gray cloud for me. Um, but now I also know that right now, at this point in time, there isn't really anything I can do. There's no diet, there's no vitamins, there's no anything I can do or take to make a difference. I wouldn't have children, so I think that would be mm -hmm. the difference, but mm -hmm. I think I, I wouldn't get tested. So I actually understand how this 90% of people feel. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are just a lot of people feel that there isn't really anything they can do about it other than live with the stigma, the problem, the issues, the worry, I mean, you know, imagine I drop my keys and that's okay, but they drop their keys and they feel like, is this the beginning? Am I starting to show signs? Right. Yeah. Very, very challenging. And, and, and so that's where the science comes in, right? That's where the work that you're doing in the clinic and, and these trials come in. Because if you were able, through a series of trials, not mm. you, but if we as a community yeah. were able right. to say, you know what? we we had a lot of ideas, and it turns out most of them don't work, but mm. these two ideas really work well. Right. You basically liberate these people, yeah. and, and, and it's, then it's really important for them to know if they have the diagnosis or not right. because they, they get to get treated. Yeah. Now, we're, I'm sure we're, I wish we were months away from that. I'm sure mm -hmm. we're many years away from that, mm -hmm. but that's the liberation that mm -hmm. great science brings, and, uh, and I, 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 I hope for that day. I, I long for that day because I can see how all these folks are living with not, it may be partly cloudy, mm -hmm. but there's a cloud there and mm -hmm. that would be so valuable for them as human beings not to have to worry anymore. Yeah, I, um, this, is the, this is the most challenging neurologic disease uh, um, I have spent a long time with and uh, I think you either, you either uh, love it, you really, really want to do it, really want to take care of these patients, or you don't. And I can honestly say that over all the years, I've met lots of uh, house officers and docs and, mm. and, and uh, other scholars, and, you know, some of whom you knew kind of were going to do it, were going to go somewhere, um, take over another clinic and, and, and really do this, and others who just really couldn't because, because it's tough. Mm. It's really tough. It's it's tough dealing with the families. The, we have a, a wonderful predictive testing program at UCSD. Um, we actually, I think, are the least expensive in the country. Um, and so um, we do follow the HDSA guidelines. Uh, we, we have a, a genetic counselor who meets with the patients and, and uh, first, uh, and then we go through everything. And then we use a swab. We used to have to draw blood. Now we can just use a, a swab and, and take some DNA from the mouth cavity. Um, and then basically after about two weeks, the patient can come back and get the results. Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, some people don't come mm. back. Uh, some mm -hmm. people um, do come back, but uh, you know, that, that moment, that moment that you're there with them, their families with them or their loved ones, uh, giving them the results, especially a positive result, is just one of the most difficult things I think I've ever done. And sometimes they're very, very young people. Um, and uh, it's it's just it's the one it's the, one of the most difficult things I do. It's one of the, you know predictive testing, but it's mm -hmm. so important. And um, because a lot of people, you know, there's that added blight of the need for confidentiality that I think people forget about. So that that whole genetic uh, stigma. Uh, and so um, 
off, we, we, we offer tremendous confidentiality so that the testing is done, it doesn't get into medical records. Mm -hmm. and, and this is really, we have people coming from all over the country for this testing here at UCSD. So, so that part of it's rewarding, a part of it, you know, to be able to help people, to be able to give them good news when it's good, uh, and then to make them realize that they have support, they have friends, they have us for, you know, as long as they want us, we're kind of there. The um, thing that I think becomes tougher is we have now gotten into children of children mm -hmm. of parents that I started with in mm -hmm. 1996, and so a couple generations. Yeah, a couple of generations, and we know we know all these families. We know them too well, so it's it's tough. It's really tough. Jody, we thank you for your humanity, for your science, for your courage. You're remarkable. Thanks for being on the program. Thanks. And thanks for being with us on Our Mind, UCSD TV.